Okay, so it's a joint work with George Gale and uh, Mehmet Soitas, who was a, our student at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, we think of human capital transmission across generations to be an important part of uh, persistence in inequality. And I'm going to, uh, there, I'm going to focus on early parental time investment and also presumably uh, in monetary investment. And people of course have worked on it and show that early investment is really important to determining uh, later outcomes. Um, one thing we're going to look at uh, is differences in achievement gaps between black and white individuals. Uh, you know, there is a education gap, labor market gaps, but the new thing that we're going to uh, look at is that the marriage market, in fact, of black and white is different, and who you marry uh, has a lot to do with your wealth later on in life. So we want to think about returns to, achieve, uh, to returns to parental investment in terms of long-term outcome, but also think about assortative mating and who people marry. Um, so there is a lot of work on, uh, on differences in the labor market and differences in score gaps, but uh, not so much that documented the differences in uh, marriage market. Um, so if you just look at the data, there is defi definitely lower income and less time investment in children of black mothers. Uh, we're looking at both fathers and mothers, but mothers make still most of the time investments. And we wanna think of what determines this early investment, including the time investment, and try to get at this uh, black-white differential, but also differences between uh, education class, etc. So let me just show you uh, one graph. What I have here is, let's look at the, at the, blue, uh, at the blue lines. So what I have here is annual time investment in kids. So this is the, the, bl the blue bars are, um, are time use survey data. So it's actual time investment that is spent with kids. And we look at white mothers and black mothers and by number of kids. So you could definitely see that white mothers are zero. They make substantially more, this is annual hours, time investment relative to black mothers. Uh, the red bars is our data, it's the PSID, but we don't really observe time spent with kids, so in two slides I'll tell you exactly what we do, but I wanna show you that these patterns definitely exist. So definitely, this, you know, these, are, these are fairly big differences. The second thing I wanna focus on is the family structure. So it turns out that one, you know, one of the empirically, one thing that explains the differences in the time allocation between black and white is actually marital status. So if you look at married households versus single households, again, the time use survey is in blue, and I'll explain what we're uh, using, but that's from the PSID. And again, these are annual hours. Zero are single households, and uh, one are married, and it's by number of kids from one to four. And you could definitely see that there is a pretty big gap uh, in hours invested in you know, married household uh, these are females make a lot, of more, a lot more time investment in children than single households. Single also cohabiting? No, so we don't distinguish, whenever I say married here is, is also cohabiting. So single is really, the father doesn't, you know, you're, typically the father doesn't live in the house. Do you make a distinction in service among the married? No, so married and cohabitation, marriage and cohabitation will be the same. I'll show you how we model it and, and it's sort of. Uh, they are, but I still think that the first order difference is, is between single and, and, co uh, and married and cohabitation. I agree with you, but we don't, here we don't make the distinction. I, I just wonder what compares to the child in terms of being married and cohabitation. Uh, I'm not sure. You have to also you know, control for a lot of other things. I'm not sure. But I think that still the, the biggest difference is between uh, married and, and cohabiting. And married and, and married single versus uh, a household where two parents living in. But we, we just, we don't make a distinction here. 
Um, now, if you look at black and white populations, then the probability of being a single parent, and again, single parent, there is no father in the household usually, uh, of a child under six, which is this is where we're going to look at the main investment, is 65% in our sample. It's 68 to 97 in the PSID, and it's only 14% for white individuals. The rest are cohabiting or, uh, or married. Um, and again, investment is lower in single parent household. Um, the second thing that is important is family size and spacing of kids. So family size, when you have more kids, then you have limited resources. So obviously the resources are split on more kids. Uh, second spacing, we're looking at young children. So families that have a lot of, a lot of young children who are under six have obviously more tighter time constraint and, and presumably income as well. If you look in our sample in the black population, you have roughly in the, for families with two or more kids, you have roughly a uh, half year difference. Uh, in black families, there is half year less difference when you look at spacing of children. So we wanna really focus on transmission of human capital. That would be the only, uh, the only way to, transform, uh, to transmit wealth across generations. And one thing that is obviously important is opportunity cost of time. So more educated people have less kids and they spend more time with their kids. The opportunity uh, cost of time is higher. But do you have other measures of time input? I'm sorry? Like, you know, like childcare. Yes. Like, I mean, how, that's not part of what, that's just the mother's allocation. But what about the allocation of the whole family into the child? I mean, so the, we're going to look at child both. Childcare replacements. And so. So I'll show you what, what I have in the data. So we're only going to uh, look, we look at father and mother time at home. All we see is really allocation, it's the PSID. So all we really see is how much time you work, which we model, how much time you spend on housework, and I'll tell you what we do. Uh, but we're not gonna be able to fully control to, you know, what this housework is and how much chi uh, people spend on childcare. Uh, I'm just saying substitutes. You, you know, instead of having their own time, they hire a substitute. That's pretty pervasive, so I'm just wondering how you handle it in terms of... Yeah, so the way we are going to handle it, I'll show you in the model, and the only way we could really handle it is first we, uh, we could just generally say, uh, look at control for level of incomes and, you know, and kind of assume that uh, the number of kids and the and level of income, people with the same characteristics and number of kids sort of spend, you know, allocate the, the time and their money the same way. That's, that's, only, that's the only way to, but, but I'll show you in the model exactly, it will be clear what we're doing. Um, so what affects investment of black and white? So first, there are both differences in costs and differences in returns, and we wanna be able to disentangle it. If you think of opportunity cost in the labor market, it could be lower than, uh, it could be, comes from, it's coming from the cost side, uh, if blacks have, if there is some discrimination or other reasons that black earn less, it could affect the cost. However, it could also affect the return. So for par when parents make early investment, they take into account that labor market earnings might be lower. But the second thing that might be big is that the marriage market, so I'm thinking of, of assortative mating. When you go to college, you think of who you're gonna marry and that's a big part of your portfolio later on. Then for blacks, actually I'm gonna, the marriage market is much, is much larger the differences. So 60%, 63% of married white females, again, married, marriage or cohabitation, we don't distinguish between those, uh, with college degree have a spouse with college degree, and only 30% black females with college degree marry somebody with college degree. There is much more assortative mating in the white population. The second thing, so we think about the single versus married household. So we think about investment, so you have tighter time constraint and you can't be as efficient as families and share resources or specialize. So that affects the cost when you make investment, but it's also, it's also affecting the returns because the returns to college would be such that you might not marry anyone if relative to whites. So we wanna look at, we wanna be able to sort of distinguish and look at the source of what affects these differences in investments. The problem is that fertility, spacing of kids, labor supply, and time you spend with kids are determined jointly. Um, and we need a model and we need to somehow control for this dynamic selection. So let me tell you what the model is that we're using. Because we want to sort of capture all of these things 
when we analyze this investment in kids. So we're going to use uh, a dynastic altruistic uh, household uh, models. And we're going to take a uh, Lowry 81 model. We're only going to look at you allocate time. We have no borrowing and no savings. So you allocate time. You income affects kids when they're young. And some of the hours go to kids. And that's the only way to, uh, to transmit wealth across generations. And we sort of combine it with a borrow becker framework where you have endogenous fertility. Uh, Alvarez uh, has sort of a model where he combines both of them. But we're going to add two, two things to, to these models. First, we're going to model life cycles. So within this dynastic framework, we're going to, within generation, capture the life cycle. So every period, household, uh, each person in the household choose labor supply, time with kids, and whether to have a kid or not. So we're going to control for all this dynamic selection that goes within. And also, being, we'll be able to model spacing of children. The second thing that is actually the most challenging is to add uh, household decisions uh, into this Barrow-Becker model. In fact, it's not very trivial. And there is a paper by, by Bernheim and Bagwell that, says, that shows that once you add marriages, all the, dynasty, all the dynasties become links, and everybody is in the utility function of everybody. So we, I'll show you how we circumvent that. But it's actually not an easy problem, because the original framework is written for a single decision maker. So we're actually going to capture the household decision and the interaction between the household. So, and of course, we're going to have marriage and assortative mating. It's a partial equilibrium model. Again, there is no borrowing and no savings. Um, so really, we're focusing on the time allocation that people make and the fertility decisions. Um, so preferences and constraints are going to affect choices of par that parents make over the life cycle in each generation. Uh, and again, every period you allocate time between the, both the father and the mother between time with kids and labor supply, and then the rest is leisure and, and fertility. Now, how do we model household? And that goes to the question of cohabitation versus marriage. All we're doing here is we are allowing for households to share income and sort of specialize. So the trade-offs are different if you're married and you want to increase time with children, you might not have to give up consumption because your spouse may work more in the labor market and make transfers to you and pay for the kids. And you don't have that in single parent household. So even in the model, there is no uh, distinction really between marriage and, and, marriage and cohabitation. The, the, the couples do not divorce in your model? We do, no, no, we do. So we okay. have marriage and divorce. I'll show you how we have it. So they're not decisions. Uh, they evolve stochastically over time, and individuals take those into account when they make decisions. Now, this stochastic evolution of marriage and divorce de depend on the households, on the actions. So you take the actions, you really affect the probability that puts you maybe on a you know, path to divorce or marriage. So it's endogenous in a predetermined sense. But a, dif a difference between marriage and cohabitation could be in the conditional probability of divorce. Everything given, it could be that cohabiting couples are more likely to divorce, and that's taken into account. But, you know, I'm just. Right, so, so we, don't, uh, we, only, we only condition on the features of the couples. So to some extent, there is differences in observed characteristics between cohabiting and divorce, uh, cohabiting and married people. We can capture that, but, but that's all we could do. Um, so uh, another thing is that in our model, the, the role of household here is that only women, we assume women make fertility choices. So if you're single and a man, you cannot make fertility decision. When you're in a household, you still don't make the decision, but it's an equilibrium. So it could be that if you behave nicely and you work more and put time with kids, you increase probability of, of fertility. So that's the only sense in which, this is how we model uh, mar marriage versus single, singlehood. Uh, the nice thing about the dynastic framework is that there are a lot of different dimensions to outcomes. Uh, we have education, and we have the spouse characteristics, but it gives me, I can just have one aggregate measure of return, which is the valuation function of your children. So 
so it kind of nicely aggregate um, all, all these different dimensions. So I'm going to show you the model, and we're going to estimate it with two generations. So you have multiple generations, but what's the length of life of each generation? Are there, are there periods within the life cycle of the generation? No, so... So one period generation. Uh, so each generation, right, so... You, so all the times in, within each generation during the life cycle when you make the decisions of fertility and time investment with kids, uh, you're making it, all you know is that if you have a boy or a girl, but we are assuming that once decisions are over, that's, then the outcome of the kids are realized, so they're not really overlapping, and then the kids become adults. Um, so we're going to estimate this returns to investment, looking at the valuation function, aggregating everything. We're all going to estimate the cost. I'll tell you how, you know, uh, how we measure cost. And we want to see how they vary by race, education, and gender. Especially, we're going to focus on, on race. We're going to estimate also a level of altru altruism, so, which actually provides insight to parental decisions. We're, we're going to sort of look at investment decisions and separate preferences, endowments, of, and, and markets. Uh, OK, so we touch a lot of literature. Our, our, our paper is correlated with a lot of literature. And uh, I'm going to say that, let me just focus on the closest paper that, uh, the main contribution of the, of the paper, the way I see it, is that we look at the returns to parental investment, but we focus on the household decisions and controlling for opportunity cost of time when, when that are, is involved with time allocation. So the closest paper is, in fact, Del Boca, Flynn, and Wiswell. Uh, they quantify the returns to time investment, and they have endogenous labor supply, looking at the opportunity cost of labor supply, and they control for all this dynamic selection. But they look at short-term outcomes. So the main contribution, to, I think, to the literature is that we look at long-term outcomes. We look at lifetime earnings. We look, at, um, uh, we look at the marriage market, and we look at the quantity quality of uh, trade-off of the kids. So, so that's how, how I view it. Um, so let me talk about the data. So we, we have the PSID, and we need the entire panel from 68 till 97. So unfortunately, we don't really see time that you actually spend with kids. All we see is labor supply, annual housework, and that's it. So what we're going to do is simply take the data. So we only have three measures that you use time, which one we call time spent with kids. One is labor supply, which we observe. The rest is, is leisure, what, what remains. So what we're doing is what people did before us in the literature. We normalize the data. So what we're going to do is just compare each, uh, uh, take a person who is married and given the education and the, and, uh, and the gender and look at the same class of people and how much time they spend on housework when they don't have kids and the residual is attributed to time with kids. So of course, part of it is not actual activities with, with kids. We've done, you know, we try variation of this, and we compared it to the time use survey data, which is not perfect because it's not the same years. Our years is until 97, the time use survey is 2003 and on. But the main patterns are, are, are looking like they're the same. The levels are not the same, so, but what we're doing, we have discrete choice models, so we only have three levels of time investment, none, medium, and high, and actually these seem to kind of match at least. Look, they look sort of reasonable. Why don't uh, you use the time use data? Oh, I don't CDS, have a data panel. So <laughs> the PSID CDS, that's the one we use. As the time but I don't have it for the years. I need two generations, and I need a panel every period, so, so I can't use it. I, all I could do is just compare it, but again, it's not overlapping with our with our with our. So if I remember, there is a very different behavior of uh, housework or what you um, your measure across the age of, over the age of the children, and it means it doesn't change basically because it's flat because it's housework. Yeah, but but after we normalize it, it looks a bit different. So, and, and we, when we compare it to the time use, at least from the American time use survey to the actual time with kids, actually the pattern, especially after we discretize it, actually the levels look actually, they, they, they kind of capture the patterns. 
I could also check it with, with the PSID though. So, so we definitely see for this, we see variation. Um, so just to tell you, we have two generations. We're going to have stationary equilibrium, so we don't account for changes over these years, really, because it's, it's sort of a steady state equilibrium. Um, so the thing I want to show you is uh, roughly we have uh, 6,813 individuals in the first generation, 5,500 individuals in the second generation. And, but these are not two distinct generations. We have a lot of overlap, and the mean at least education is not that different in the sample, but again, uh, that's, that's all we, could, uh, we can check. So here's the model. You have female and male. Uh, each adult lives for T periods and within each generation. So each period you make a discrete labor supply choice, none, part-time or full-time. Same with time spent with kids, uh, none, low or high. And females make birth decision one or zero. Uh, we have stochastic production function of child characteristics. So this is how we map the investment into the outcomes of the kids. Uh, first, we look at the first five years in the life cycle, and we look at, we have no borrowing and savings, so we take the actual income up to age five. Uh, we take the parents' characteristics, which is education, sex, race, and also skill. By skill, I mean we're going to have uh, very limited unobserved heterogeneity measures, so it's fixed effect from the labor market. So in a way, you could think about it as permanent income, and, and I know, and, uh, and Carnero and Heckman show that once you control for that, income itself may not have big effect, but if it does, then early in the life cycle, it's more important. But, but so, so these are the inputs. And again, you have mother and father. And what's going to happen is this. So we're going to have uh, outcome of kids. We first, you, you take all the input and that maps stochastically to education. So we don't model the process of, of production function of kids. It's just you see if you have a boy or a girl and over the life cycle you make decisions and after you're about to die, the kid education is being realized. Now given the education, now we have a stochastic function that maps it into the spouse characteristics, which would be again education and their labor market fixed effect. So you take into account the child education and also who they're going to marry when, uh, probabilistically when you're making investment decisions. Um, and then we have earnings. So this is the earning function. It's a bit sta it's standard. We have uh, gender, uh, sorry, we have in it education. We're going to have experience. So we're, we're looking at the dynamics of labor supply and time investment with kids. So we have returns to experience, part-time or full-time, and how much you work full-time or part-time. This is all in the earnings equations. So there's, course, is there any kind of budget constraint where you could, you could work a lot of time, you could spend a lot of time with your kid, and there's no, is there anything that, that constrains that trade-off? So that's the, is it the next slide? Not yet. It's, uh, basically, we have a discrete choice model. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a parameter that for each combination of choices, so for each level of labor supply and time with kids and whether there is a birth or not for, uh, for female, there is a different coefficient. So that would actually capture the disutility with all the combinations. Okay, so that's the life cycle. Uh, so the life cycle utility will be the following. The big U in gen, in, of person sigma, which is a male or a female, generation G, uh, cap T, this is the finite, the life cycle part of the utility. It's just the sum, the discounted sum of the per period utility plus some IID, it's uh, extreme value uh, type one error would be uh, distribution. So it's just taste shock that is attached to every combination of choices you're making every period. Uh, then I'll have U upper bar G plus one. That would be the total expected utility from all the kids that you're having. Um, and then we're going to have sort of a borrow becker uh, looking formulation of expected lifetime utility, which have expectation of time zero of your life cycle component, which is uh, from zero to T plus beta T. Now we have to discount it back times the sort of borrow becker altruistic discount factor, lambda and one minus nu. 
And that's times the average utility per kid, expected average utility per kid. So for example, if you have one kid, then uh, lambda would be something that we will estimate is how you trade consumption could, at the last period of your life between you and your kid. And you have diminishing marginal utility from children. So we're going to estimate all, this, all these parameters, including the time preference. Um, OK, so we go to the per period utility. We're just going to have risk neutrality, very simple, additive linear preferences, no borrowing, no savings. So it's actually wealth, expected wealth maximization if, you, if I didn't have fertility. There's no, there's no monetary request, though. Nothing. So it's only education that you're doing here. Only human, yeah, only, right. The only transfers are affecting education. And so here is what, how we model uh, married, uh, married individuals' household. You have some utility. You have, you have utility from your own earnings in the current period. You have some utility from alpha uh, prime from your spouse earning. Then you have utility times, you, you have some utility coefficient on the number of kids. B is whether there is birth this year, uh, this period or not. Now, in principle, I could write a budget constraint and just derive some uh, sharing, you know, sharing rules on, on total income and also a number of kids. I didn't do it because I don't have a measure of utility from kids. So the utility, this or this utility from kids is actually net utility. So it could be also non-pecuniary cost or benefit from kids. And in a new version, actually, we're, we're adding interaction term of number of kids and income. And it goes back to Jim's question of what do we do on expenditure and childcare? Well, all we could do is actually control for having families with different levels of income and their number of kids, and also this would come into the production function. Uh, all right, so for single individual, the only difference is that you cannot eat anything, you don't get any, there is no externality from your, the mother of, or father of your kid's uh, income. And the, although this is abuse of notation, these are different coefficients. So we allow for, of course, the cost of kids or the, your utility from your own income to differ between single and, and married and also for, um, for men and women. So really a family for us is having externality in, from, from income between the spouses and having different uh, costs, uh, you know, different cost of, of children. So this is back to the, this is the part of the non-pecuniary benefit from leisure or that has to do with for every, for every combination of activities that, you know, or time allocation every period. Okay, so that's how we model families. Um, we're actually having, we're modeling it as, uh, so spouses take as given this allocation of income and cost of kids as given. And then in the first stage, they are choosing simultaneously labor supply, time with kids, and whether and the woman make a, a decision of birth. Um, so, but one thing I want to add is I know there is um, con, yeah, there isn't an agreement in the literature on cooperative versus non-cooperative game. But actually, in the borrow in this dynastic borrow Becker type models, it's not trivial at all to write it up as a uh, as a you know as as an efficient uh, as an efficient problem. As a, as a problem in which you have constraint efficiency. Uh, so, okay, so K sigma JT would be the vector of uh, choices that spouse sigma, uh, you know, spouse sigma is making in, in period T. Minus sigma is what your spouse is doing. And we're going to solve for uh, Markov perfect equilibrium. So we have uh, only pair of relevant strategies. Okay, so here is uh, what the valuation function looks like. Um, let's look at time zero for spouse sigma. This is the exante valuation function. Xt is your state variable, so it includes um, both, uh, the, uh, both the education of both spouses, your stock of human capital, your race, your gender, uh, but, but you have both, both spouses' characteristics. 
So what you have here is just uh, expectations over all the set of choices of, uh, in this period of all the spouses. This is the, prob the, this is the probability of joint uh, actions in the household. Um, and what you have here is the today's per period utility, and this is just the continuation value. And what you could see here is where marriage and divorce kicks in is through F. Because F is the stochastic, what, what, does, what it does, the stochastic part is divorce and marriage, but it depends both on both uh, spouses' characteristics and it also depends on their actions. Uh, and this is just the uh, expected value of this uh, of the shock conditional on the choices. But there's no this this function here is taken like as a primitive, or you're estimating it. I mean, you're not linking it to some marriage market or. The marriage market, oh no, so this is, I haven't finished, it's not done, but that's the, mar the mar for the next generation, it's right. the next slide. Because this is, you could see it up, this is for T uh, until your last period. So let me show you the next slide. Okay. Uh, so is it in, okay, it's to, let me go first to the last slide. Two slides, and I, we are linking it, so of course, and we're estimating it. So best response function, it's the same as the conditional valuation function. Okay, so what you have is that the utility from the actions, right, conditional on certain choices, plus uh, next period ex ante valuation function with the Fs. And I, these are the best response probability for each action given your spouse's choices you need that your action will maximize your utility, right? So the valuation from action, J is better from all the actions. So let's, this is how we link it. If you look at the last period and, and, and you, you work it backwards, so this is the conditional valuation, it's today's utility, but here is your uh, valuation from, uh, this is the discount, this is your total number of kids, and here is the, uh, this is the production function of kids that maps uh, your inputs into the outcomes. So you just go backwards, and I'm going to show you a presentation that links it all together, actually. But we definitely estimate it with the linking, with the linkage. Okay, I don't know, is the marriage in the parents' generation? What's the marriage market? How does that model the parents? I understand you're just filling in, right? If you're this type, this is the distribution. But what about in the initial period? So, okay, so we're, we're estimating a stationary equilibrium. We're pulling together everybody. And it's great that function to be the same for the parents. So exactly. Not that really saying that function comes from exactly. Correct. Um, okay, so just uh, cost of time depends on, obviously, on the, everybody's characteristics. Uh, you, you could see the quantity quality trade-offs that if you put less time, the average per, you know, time per kid is, uh, is going to be lower. Um, let me actually jump to how we are estimating it. So uh, estimation is actually hard of this type of model and we might have, uh, um, and we might have, uh, multi, uh, and we might have multiple equilibria. So, and we have a game, so what we're doing, just like the uh, uh, literature on games, is that now conditional on your spouse, on, on the state variables, but on your spouse strategy, or it's, 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 it's looking like a single agent dynamic, uh, dynamic optimization problem. And we're able to, to develop alternative representation to fit it in sort of a hot Miller-ish type. The, the hard part is that it's non-standard because you have finite horizon within an infinite horizon uh, problem. So step one, here's, let me just lay out what we're doing. We're going to estimate it in step. We're estimating the earnings equation and the fixed effect uh, uh, with like a McCordy 81, that's the fixed effect. The fixed effects are inputs to all the choice probabilities, best response probability, and the production function of kids. So it's really three steps. Then we're also estimating all this conditional choice probability, the transition probability, including the marriage and divorce, and the education production function using this, controlling for this fixed effect. Then we're going to, we need to estimate the utility function parameter and the intergenerational um, discount factors. So we're able to write it 
a representation so that, uh, for, that is just a moment condition, and we use Hotzmiller, Sander, and Smith to, to estimate the structural parameters. The contribution of the paper is have a representation for V0 um, to link it back so we could estimate it in steps. So we have moments for the intergenerational problem and the moments for the intragenerational transition uh, problem that allows us to do that. But I'm actually going to skip it. Um, I'm, uh, let me go to the, uh, let me actually, this is the new part of the paper. Here's what we do. We need to get the valuation function in terms of the transition functions, the best response probability, all the first step estimation, and the per period utility parameters. The problem is that unlike life cycle problem in the end, I, hit, I'm hit, I'm hit, I have a hit of another valuation function which is infinite of the kids. But what we're doing, we have it here. This is the whole life cycle. This is the intergenerational transmission including the, uh, including the discount factor. And I have V here. In fact, we showed that you could invert it. I have it on the right-hand side, the left-hand side, and get it back to representation of, as a function of stuff we estimated from the data and per period utility. So that's, that's the main contribution in terms of the estimation. All right, uh, education production function. Um, we did it a couple of ways, but uh, everything is predetermined uh, all the inputs are predetermined of the parents. So they don't see any outcomes until they finish investing. The problem is that we have simultaneity of uh, time and, and income. And so we do a three-stage least square um, when we have labor supply equation and we have time equation. Um, but let me show you the main result. This is simply a linear probability model. This is probability that your kid goes to high school, get some college, and go to college. And here are the main results that, that I think are the main results. First, mother and father time is, complementar, is complementary. So mother time increases the probability of going to college. But what father's time does is really truncating the bad outcome. It truncates the probability that you're not going to finish high school. It doesn't affect the probability that you're going to go to college. Second thing is that females are, for the same inputs, conditional for everything, Females are, have higher probability of going to college or some college. Interesting thing, black have higher variance. In fact, conditional on, any, on everything, they're more likely to finish college, but also more likely to not finish high school. So these are the main results that we're going to, to use. Earning equation is standard, but what I want you to take from it is that um, the returns to education, we estimate a, a fixed Conditional on everything, yeah. they're actually have higher, very, they're more likely to not finish college, okay, and more likely to finish college than whites. How does that arise in terms of your model? I'm just, you have an intuition. There's a lot going on here, I'm not quite sure. Oh, but this is, but this is just, this is like three stage least square with linear probability. It has not, it's, it's estimated outside the model. It's simply. I'm just wondering how you use your model to uh, sort of inform this result. Oh, we're putting it, these are the transition functions in the, uh, in this, um, the production function of kids. You I see, you're going to take this as some kind of primitive. Exactly. I see, okay. So all I the first stage are, are primitive. Sorry. Sorry. No, 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 they're all primitives, exactly. So you really need to kind of wrap up now, we've got three minutes, basically. Okay. Uh, let me go to the main results then. I, I compute, <laughs> all right. Here's what I want to show. I want an aggregate measure of, of I want an aggregate measures of the, of the returns to parental time. So what I do, I have the sum of the valuation of the kids that I actually simulated. This is a counterfactual. And I look at how the, the, uh, the returns to kids changes when, well, when I change the time with the kids. So this is accounting for everything. Um, Again, it accounts for labor market, it accounts for marriage market. It's the, value, it's the change of the valuation functions of your kids when you increase time with kids. So we just take this, uh, this valuation function, we simulate it, and we regress it on time investment. And the main thing that we find, actually, 
is that the returns, that's maybe the main result of the paper. The return for parental time of mothers is higher for blacks than for whites. The valuation function of blacks is lower than whites, but on the margin, they have higher returns. So the reason really that black mothers put less time doesn't come from the valuation, even though we, they have much worse marriage market and they have black tax in the, in the labor market. It comes from the cost and it comes from the time constraint because you have a lot of single mothers. So I think that's the main result. Second is that uh, father's time is important, but mother's time is 60% more productive. Um, so this is the summary uh, of, of, what you're, of what we're getting. The second thing I want to show you is the change in the average quality of a kid when you increase number of kids for black and white. This is a measure of quantity quality trade-off. And I want to say why. So let me show you it in a graph. So, so take a family with four kids, okay? This is uh, black and this is white. We do it for girls and for boys. So this is a family with one girl, uh, with, uh, with, with two girls, three girls, and four girls. As you decrease the number of girls in general, the average, this is the average valuation function per kid. The quality of a kid declines. So you have a large quantity quality trade-off that is involved with, with having boys, and girls only after the third girl you get quantity quality trade-off. Second thing is that for blacks, have, you know, the, the quantity quality trade-off is much larger. And what I want to say that, again, it doesn't come, f it, it comes from the time constraint. You have a lot more single uh, black, uh, black mothers, and therefore when they have another kid, especially boy, they don't put a lot of time because of the time constraint and the average valuation of a kid goes down by a lot. Uh, this is for the same gender, just to show you. So the red is, this is uh, by number of kids, the average, this is the average, this is the log valuation function of a kid. On an average, kid in a family is a function of a number of children. This is blacks, if you have all boys, this is what happens to the average quality of a kid. Uh, for white, it also declines, but again, there is less, it's, it's a lot higher. And again, you see uh, for girls, only after the third kid you have quantity quality trade-off. The reason is that conditional on all the inputs, girls are much more likely to go to college. But what I didn't show you, they also get transfers from the husbands. So the lifetime valuation function of a female is higher despite the gender tax. Um, so how much time do I have? Uh, minus a few minutes. Oh. <laughs> okay, so uh, these, are the, these, are the, these are the main things I wanted to show you. Okay, we have time for uh, one or two questions. How do we think about childlessness? Well, the decision not to have children. That is, a certain number of women never have children, and presumably this is by choice for many of them. How do we think about this in the model? Yes, uh, so I still need to, first you have to Probably it's women who have very high, uh, very high opportunity cost of time. Uh, I don't know if they are single, but it makes more sense if it's you know if also single women with high opportunity cost of time are going to be more likely to do that because you have also taste shock. Um, that that would be the first order thing that would that 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 would cause that in a model. 